between people and machines. How psychology builds empathy between humans and robots. Leila Takayama, University of California, Santa Cruz. On the 9th of November, 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, I was in Honolulu, Hawaii, listening to the news on the radio. Good morning. Thank you. You know, whenever I tell people that I work on human-robot interaction, usually the first thing that they talk to me about is the Terminator or Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons. It depends on if they're scared of robots or really excited about that future of having a robot clean their home. I want to talk to you today about a different kind of Rosie, the Riveter. This is a call for me to you for action. So right now, robots are nowhere near that science fiction future that we've seen with the Terminator or Rosie. We're not even close. And I think we need to be exploring a broader diversity of robotic futures. And to do that, we actually need help from folks like you, people who are working in policy, who are in business, in design, social sciences, engineering, uh, the arts, and beyond. We need a broader set of perspectives if we're going to have a chance at making these things work in the ways that we want them to work, in a more human-centered kind of future for this, these robotic systems. So I, my hope is that by the end of this talk today, I'll have convinced you that robots are really not that scary, and they actually need your help. You've probably seen lots of creepy videos on the internet, not only in sci-fi, of robots doing amazing things. And these are major feats of engineering. That's, there's no doubt about that. But the thing is, if you've posted the video on YouTube, it's because you're really excited that it actually worked, right? This is a hard field. It's a big research field. There are many big brains working on these systems. And what we don't show you is all of those failures that came before. The other thing that we tend not to show you is the people behind these systems, right? So those amazing robots that ran around and wiggled their butts in the cars and drove them over to help the Fukushima plant, right? Those robots were actually operated by amazing teams of PhD students at places like MIT, live. They were there helping to tell the robots what to do and when to do them. And yes, there are lots of bits of autonomy, but there's lots of bits of humans in these systems too. Uh, when Spot Mini goes up on stage and does his little dance, there is dynamic control that is autonomous, but there's also a guy with a laptop who always comes along with Spot Mini and tells him what to do and when to do it, right? So there are parts of these systems that are autonomous and amazing, and there are parts of these systems that are human and amazing too. And I think that it's up to us to start recognizing these robot wranglers because they're critical for the success of these systems to work, which you're gonna see today. These expectations that we're setting of robots with these YouTube videos are too high. <laughs> um, yes, they do things that are amazing sometimes, but a lot of times they fail. And we need to be helping to set realistic expectations about these robots. We actually have empirical data from my lab where we ran a psychology experiment. We randomly assigned people to one of two conditions. In one condition, we told them to have high expectations about the robots. And in the other condition, they had low expectations. Very simple. All of these people actually interacted with the exact same robots, <laughs> right? So all we did was prime them for high or low expectations. What we found was what you learn in business school, which is that you should underpromise and overdeliver. You should not tell people that this robot is going to be your best friend because it's not, <laughs> right? You should tell people that you know it has these capabilities but not these other ones, and so. Have fun with it, but just understand that it's still a robotic system. It still has limitations, and it's not the same kind of intelligence that you have, and that's fine. I think what's more important than just the perceptions is also what that means behaviorally for people. So this guy had high expectations, and he decided to see if the robot could avoid falling off the edge of the table. It really didn't end so well. That robot's arm uh, and ear broke off. This second participant, oops, can we see that there? Had low expectations. And she did, she did something very smart, which you'll see in a moment. Yep, definitely. She did. caught him before he fell. Right, so because she had slightly lower expectations of what this robot could do, she actually helped it to get its job done. And that's a good thing. 
Um, I would actually argue that this is better for robots, even if we're not going to be giving you know, the normal boisterous marketing message for these machines. It actually helps the machines to operate better when we're ready to catch them when they fall. These robots live in very noisy, scary worlds, right, for them. <laughs> and let me show you what that, that world looks like to these robots. So remember, I'm setting your expectations lower and lower for these systems. This was state of the art when I started working at a place called Willow Garage in Menlo Park. This robot is trying very hard to find that door. It's got this great point cloud of 3D data, and it's eventually going to find the door. And then it's going to motion plan its arm up to the handle. And then you're just going to hope that that handle is on a door that's not locked, because it can't handle a key. And it's going to do it, right? And as a roboticist, this took, oh my goodness, probably more than six months for our team to do, right? With a team of people with PhDs in robotics. This is not easy work. Um, and that's fine, right? It's still in the research phases. It's still science. The problem was that my office was off to that side of that door, and the coffee machine in our office was on this side. And so I would often walk in front of it to get my coffee, because that's my fuel. And every so often, the software engineering team, right, the set of PhDs in robotics, would say, stop running in front of the robot. You messed up the point cloud. Now we got to start all over, and we got to find the door again, right? And uh, I felt bad. I apologized. I don't want to get in the robot's way ever. And I don't want it to hit me, right? And so I told them, like, well, I can't really tell when the robot's trying to find a door versus when it's just sitting there doing nothing. So we went and got some help uh, from friends who could do this much better than we can. So Doug Dooley is a character animator at Pixar Animation Studios, and he was telling us this. Your robots right now show no forethought. So all they do is sit there and stare at the door. If they completely ignore any human in their environment, and they do their functional task, but that's all they're doing. What if instead, the robots did what characters on screen do, which is show a little bit about thinking. Show that they're looking around, that they're aware of humans in the environment, and then did their job. Would that make a difference? Our empirical studies show that they do. They make robots more approachable and appealing when they do this. The other thing robots know is if they've succeeded or failed at a task. You give them a goal, and they either do it or they don't. The problem is they don't care. <laughs> so usually, they show no reaction to success. But what if instead they showed a little bit of happiness about doing that well? This is my favorite set. So usually I said, you know, robots fail because robotics is hard. Uh, so robots normally don't care about their failure. They just move on and go on to the next goal. What if instead they showed just a little bit of remorse <laughs> for not having gotten that done? Right? What does that do? It's showing you awareness. It's showing you that it's, it knows that you're there. It's got this social skill of expressing to you what it's good and bad at, what it's happy or sad about. Right? It's not just sitting there emoting. It's emoting about a goal that it has. So we tried to run this study uh, between participants, where half of the people were not shown, success to to shown reactions to success or failure, and half of them were shown reactions. Um, and here again, we found that people feel like those robots are actually more competent if they do show reactions to their success or failure. And that is a good thing, because these robots actually need social skills if they're going to have to survive in the human environment, not just in factory cages anymore. You actually don't need to have a robot that's almost like a human for this stuff to work. And we're actually going to give you a little demo of that today. So with the panda, right, this is an industrial robot arm. This is designed for doing very functional tasks. And so what I'm going to do is ask him to give a little functional <laughs> show off here. Uh, could you pass me the tangerine? And by the way, Saskia is our amazing robot wrangler here. We're keeping the humans in the loop. Nice. That's perfect. Good job. There's the little happy dance. <laughs> All right, could we try maybe getting the pear? Uh-oh. Yeah, that's not the pear. Mm, no, that, that wasn't the right one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Feel bad about it. <laughs> you see how that feels, right? It doesn't need to be humanoid. It doesn't need to be dog-like. But that feels sad. <laughs> it 
Thanks. <laughs> nice work. Yeah, so, you know, as you see, it doesn't take much for it to be expressive and for us to start to understand what's going on for that robot. What was its goal? What was it trying to do? And is it aware of whether or not it did a good or bad job? Thanks for that, Saskia. I think another robot that's out there is actually an art installation that I love in Manhattan. Uh, this robot is socially brilliant. It has one degree of freedom. All it does is roll forward. It has a little flag that says, I'm trying to get to this intersection in Manhattan, and it's cute. And so by relying upon the kindness of strangers, this robot just rolls forward with this little flag, and people will grab it by the head and turn it around, or push it with their feet. Either way, he actually manages to navigate across a busy Manhattan park. These people are not known for making eye contact with each other or smiling at other strangers, but they'll help a little robot that's in need. And that robot is socially brilliant, super low cost, and only one degree of freedom, right? That's pretty amazing. And maybe manipulative, right? And we need to start thinking about what does that mean? But the point here is really that these robots need social skills. They need to be expressive and readable to the people who don't have PhDs in robotics, right? To the people who are just in their environment and need to make sense of what's going on with these systems. Recently, my lab started doing a bit of research with looking at people who operate robots like these. So these are robots where you can walk up to them and interact with them from the front, right? We're interacting with each other. These robots are ones where you interact with the world through the robots. So at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Doc Ricketts is a robot that's huge, and it's used for doing deep sea ocean sciences, right? And so these are the robot wranglers. They're amazing pilots. These folks look at more than a dozen screens all at once. <laughs> they control many different body parts of the robot all at the same time. There's two seats, the pilot and the co-pilot, and then they've got the principal scientists and their assistants next to them. And somehow, they can do amazing things that these robots can't do autonomously yet, and maybe never will, but that's okay. Within their fleet of science robots, they have autonomous underwater vehicles, or AUVs, and they have these people who are amazing puppeteers of robots that can do marine science in the deep sea, in places where you couldn't do them with your normal human body. And so they use this mix of autonomous systems and human-operated systems to get science done. And I think that's a beautiful thing, and it's, I think, a place where we can start learning about how and when and where we want to use bits of autonomy, and where it just makes sense to leverage human skills, right? We're differently intelligent, and that's okay, and we can combine our skills to do more than we could do separately. So back to that call to action. <laughs> if you're a roboticist in this room, or a computer scientist, I beg you to please, please zoom out those cameras when you shoot those YouTube videos and show the robot wranglers because they're critical to the success of these systems. Also, show what's hard about the work that we're doing because that's how you can get help from other people. If you're a social scientist, you're in the humanities, in the arts or design, these robots need to exist in socio-cultural systems, right? The reason that the little tweenbot worked in Manhattan is because that artist team had a strong sense for what would work in that particular community. And unless we engage those communities, we're not going to design the right things in the right ways to fit within that society. Finally, if you're a policymaker, don't be afraid of these systems. They're no more complicated than human psychology, organizational behavior, or dealing with societal change, right? They're human-made systems, and I think we're going to need to work together if these are going to be more human-centered by design. Thank you. <laughs>